I'm Jerry Sweeney and I'm going to be talking to Robert Dole about the theologian Paul Tillich. R Robert, could you tell us uh, how and when you first became interested in Tillich? Yes, I became interested in Tillich when I was 17 years old. I started reading his books when I was 17 years old. I was at the Phillips Exeter Academy and I was in the process of being driven insane by a psychiatrist who was given the task of changing my sexual orientation. And in the summer of 1963, here in New Hampshire, I had my first schizophrenic hallucination, which took the form of what used to be called a beatific vision. And I was quite intrigued by this experience, and I wanted to know, learn as much as, about it as I possibly could by reading. And I, that's when I started reading Paul Tillich's books. And I discovered at the age of 17 that Paul Tillich had had a similar experience. Now, I have been reading books by and about Paul Tillich for the past 55 years in English, German, and French, and I've come to some rather uh, uh, alarming con uh, conclusions that I would like to reveal to the world before I die, because I know I'm quite certain of what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, I have published three books in which I mentioned Tillich, and I have published five articles about him. <clears throat> My latest book is called What Rough Beast, which you can see right here published in London by, by Austin Macaulay in 2017. And I've published five articles about Paul Tillich in English and in French, which are included in this, um, this body of, of, of articles. Anyway, uh, I realized that Tillich had had a similar experience from reading his books. And so in March, around the beginning of March 19th... I'm sorry, when you say a similar experience, you mean...? He'd had a similar, a beatific vision. He had had a religious experience, like mine, that in, in the Middle Ages was called a beatific vision, but in the 20th century is called a schizophrenic hallucination. So I, at the tender age of 17, I had to try to understand the difference between psychosis and religious revelation. That was a big challenge for a 17-year-old boy. And so I read a great deal. I had already read the entire Bible, and I had a, a lifelong interest in theology. My father was the religion editor of the Washington Post, and I was exposed to all the many different types of churches in Washington, D.C. in the 1950s and 60s. So I had this natural inclination to be interested in religion. Anyway, when I had this religious experience, I started reading Paul Tillich, and I saw that he had had a similar experience. So in March 1965, I saw he was coming back to Harvard from Chicago to give a sermon which turned out to be the last sermon of his life. So I wrote out a 27-page essay about my vision called The Phenomenological Proof of God, which I include in this book here. And in this 27-page uh, essay, I quoted theologians, philosophers, and poets in English, French, and German, and which is really a remarkable feat for an 18-year-old boy. And I took it to Tillich, this essay, and I handed it to him, and he came down, sat next to me, and gave me a most extraordinary smile without any words. It was a, a, a beatific smile. I could see that he was, he and I were having a religious experience together. We were both convinced that God had brought us together. He was convinced that finally somebody on this earth had understood his theology correctly, namely myself. And I knew that he needed a disciple as much as I needed a master, so we made what is called a covenant in theology. It's a covenant between him and me. And four hours after that, he gave the last sermon of his life, and the last words of his sermon were, the Son of Man is in our presence. He will come as a beggar. The fate of the world depends on how he matures. And I was absolutely certain that he was talking about me. After that, I fell into the most horrible, paranoid schizophrenic psychosis that you could possibly imagine and was incarcerated for 15 months in insane asylums. Now, I've been, as I said, I read so much about Tillich, and I've discovered that he was also schizophrenic. This is something you discovered after? It's reading. something I always suspected because of what he had written. But in 1996, his former secretary at Harvard, Grace, Grace Kelly, wrote a book about her experience with Tillich at Harvard. And in this book, she records a conversation with Tillich, in which she says to him, she says, I don't know how you can stop from becoming schizophrenic. 
and he answers, that's just it, I am. In other words, he admitted that he was schizophrenic. So my experience with him raises questions, but doesn't give answers about the relationship between psychosis and religious revelation. Now, for a long, long time, people have thought that Isaiah and Ezekiel were schizophrenics, and people have also said that Jesus was schizophrenic. Now, the question is, if it's true that the Old Testament prophets in Jesus and Paul Tiddish were schizophrenics, does that mean that there's no truth in the Judeo-Christian religious traditions, or does it mean that we can look at these traditions from a different point of view and, and see a more human aspect of it? In other words, if the meeting between God and man always takes place in the context of psychosis, perhaps we should have a new attitude about schizophrenia and we should have a new attitude about religion. I, When I was in the insane asylum, the only thing that gave me hope of being able to get out of there was my memory of Paul Tillich's smile, the memory of his, of his benediction. He gave me his benediction and that's what gave me hope. I was told when I was in the insane asylum that I was the most, when I, that I, when I came in there, that I was the most severely mentally ill person they, that they had ever seen in the entire history of McLean Hospital. That's a horrible thing for a psychiatrist to say to a 19-year-old boy. The psychiatrists there they did everything that they could to discourage me. They told me I should never go back to Harvard, uh, and they tried to just say, your life is over, you have to become resigned to the fact that you're going to spend your entire life going to psychiatrists and taking psychiatric medicine. Now, for the past 50 years, I've had a most wonderful life without once consulting a psychiatrist and without once taking psychiatric medicine. And I know for a fact that I've been able to do that because I had a simple religious faith in God and in God's mercy. Now, faith in God today is considered to be irrational. We live in a world in which intellectuals, the intellectual scene is dominated by cynical atheists and in which the people who represent, who claim to represent the Christian, Christian religion, very often say the most insipid and hateful things in the name of Christ. And so it's good to be reminded of Christian intellectuals like Paul Tillich, because he was, he was the summum of German theology and philosophy. He was an extremely erudite person, and I have a fair amount of erudition myself. Anyway, uh, I would like, the purpose of my writing these books in one thing or another is to reveal to the world what I know about Tillich and what other people don't know. And there are three, there are three things that I know. I know that he, his theology to a large extent was based on his schizophrenia. I also know that he was a devout Marxist and loyal to the international Marxist movement. And this is something that he had to hide so that he could keep his career in American universities. Excuse me. How, how did you discover that? Well, by that? reading his books. And because I read German, I read very early in life, I read his German, his Marxist manifesto, Die Sozialistische Entscheidung, which he published in 1933, and which was the reason why the Nazis fired him from his job as being professor at the University of Frankfurt. He never allowed this book to be translated into English during his lifetime, because if it had been, it would have been would have meant the end of his career in American universities. So I had read that book, and I knew that uh, he was a Marxist. And uh, yes, so and I yeah. So time went on, and time went on. I lived in Europe for nine years, and I lived in, in I've been lived in Quebec now for forty one years, and I've been looking at the United States from the outside for fifty years. And I know that one thing that Tillich said about America was he said it's going to be very bad here, very very bad. And unfortunately, I think that history has proven that him right. I think that the situation in America has become very bad, and I think it's due to America's neoliberalism. And I think that American capitalism is quite literally threatening the survival of planet Earth uh, with his, by destroying the environment and one thing or another. So I think that Tillich was right in making his criticism of capitalism. He wanted to criticize capitalism and nationalism. That was his point of view. And he said that Jesus was the first socialist. So in other words, the second coming of Christ has to be a socialist. So this would be a gigantic propaganda victory for the communists if Christ reappears upon earth in the 20th century and is a socialist. This would be a, a victory, a propaganda victory for Marxists. And this is the purpose of Tillich's life. Now, Tillich was dealing with the fundamental myths of the Christian religion. 
but he also came from a school of thought in German theology and philosophy that favored the creation of new myths. This is something that German philosophers wanted to do, to create new myths for the sake of benefiting humanity. And Tillich's new myth would be a sort of divine intervention in human history on this, to support the people on the left, socialists, communists, ex-communists, anarchists, environmentalists, pacifists, people who want to improve the fate of humanity for the good of humanity. Most politicians have only one interest, and that is to create, increase their own power, their own wealth, their own glory, their own career. But people on the left have a concern about humanity in general. And Tillich wanted to create a sort of divine intervention in world history on the sake of the left. Now, when I was in the insane asylum, I told myself that obviously Tillich must be insane if he thinks that I am the Perusia. I didn't want to be the Perusia, and I said to myself, he must be insane, therefore I am not the Perusia. Could you, could you tell us what Perusia is? A Perusia is another word for the Son of Man, the Second Coming of Christ, the Lord's Anointed, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. It's a person in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Jesus talks about the Son of Man in the future. And ever since 1920, Tillich said that his theology was the theology of the Kairos. And I was the only person on earth who interpreted his theology of the Kairos in the context of the Greek New Testament. And I published an article on this subject in Strasbourg in French in 1997. It was the first time that anybody had seen the connection between Tillich's theology and the Greek New Testament. And this uh, article that I published in 1997 in France in a very prestigious review created a certain scandal because I was saying something new. And this is something that Tillich said. He said, whenever you say something new in religion, you are going to create a scandal. He talked about the difference between the prophetic tradition and the priestly pr tradition, and they are always in opposition to each other. So he thought that he was representing the prophetic tradition and the priests around him and the ministers and the pastors who are all very normally very conservative people are in the priestly tradition and they do not understand each other they do not agree with each other now when i was in the insane asylum i said i don't want to be the parousia i don't want to be the son of man i am a false christ the bible talks about true christ and false christ so i said when i get out of here my job is going to be good to go and find the true christ and he is going to be my friend. Now, I grew up in Washington, D.C. in the 50s. We had a song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So I said, Jesus is going to return to this earth, and he's going to be my friend. And he's going to save me from schizophrenia. He's going to save me from psychiatry. And he's going to save me from evil. And uh, th then I fell in love with a young man whose name was Mark Frechette when I got out of the mental hospital. Here's a picture of Mark Frechette. And I was convinced that he was the answer to my prayers. And Mark had a very sad history, a tragic history, and uh, he uh, was abused by a Catholic priest when, priest when he was 14 years old in Fairfield, Connecticut. The priest's name was Lawrence Brett. He was, Brett was protected by Cardinal Law in Boston. Mark's life fell apart at age 14 because the priest whom he had adored and worshipped and admired seduced him, and he didn't know how to deal with this situation. He dropped out of school. He became a juvenile delinquent. He was locked up in a mental hospital. He was locked up in a prison and he was killed in prison at the age of 27. But when he got out of the mental hospital, he and I became friends in Cambridge, Massachusetts and we lived together. And we had so much in common because we were both children and we both knew that our lives had been destroyed by adults, especially by psychiatrists and, and also by holy people. In Mark's case, it was a Roman Catholic priest. In my case, it was Paul Tillich. So we were both, we had both had our lives transformed or destroyed or saved to some extent by our, relation, our relationship with holy people. Anyway, so we had that in common. Uh, in 1968, when I graduated from Harvard, I said to Mark, I said, I am leaving America forever. And I went to Europe. He told me, don't leave, America needs you. And I said to him, I said, after, after what America has done to you and to me and to the blacks and to the Vietnamese, there's no way that I feel any loyalty towards America. So I left. Mark stayed here, and he was three weeks later, he was discovered by Michelangelo Antonioni, the Italian movie director, 
who made a movie in which he played the main role. The film was called Zabriskie Point, and Mark became internationally famous and was internationally famous for a brief moment of glory. And in he was then he was forgotten by the world, but in 1973, he wanted to make a revolutionary gesture to protest against Nixon, who was overthrowing Allende in Chile, who was maintaining the war in Vietnam, and who was involved in the Watergate scandal. So he made a revolutionary gesture. He was put into prison, and he was killed in prison. And this first year in prison, in 1974, I said, Mark, you are the suffering Christ. And one year later, he was crucified in prison at the age of 27. Uh, in both the prison, he's killed in his film and is killed in his in the prison. And in both situations, he's killed under the sign of the cross. In the film, he's killed in a small airplane whose wings make the sign of the cross. And in the prison, he's killed asphyxiated by fellow inmates with 150 pounds of weights on his neck, stretched out like that, which also makes the sign of the cross. Now, of course, cynical atheists would say that this is nothing but coincidence. However, I'm not a cynical atheist. I am a Calvinist, and Calvinists believe that God gives us signs to strengthen our faith. And I believe, I sincerely believe, I know that I told Mark Frechet that he was the real Christ, and I know that he was crucified. So, of course, for people who are normal in today's world, all of this is just a matter of insanity. But it's very, it's, what, what's important to bear in mind is that Mark Frechette and Paul Tillich and I all had that in common. We had the fact of having been locked up in mental hospitals. We had that in common. You, you said before there were three things you were going to talk about. You were going to talk about his Marxism. Yes, that's right. His, his, his three big secrets are Tillich's Marxism, Tillich's schizophrenia, and Tillich's idea that he had discovered the Perusia seven months before he died. Uh, yes, these are the three big secrets that I want to reveal to the world. And I also would like future generations to remember German Christians who opposed the Nazis and American Christians who opposed the war in Vietnam. Tillich was one of many, many German Christians who opposed the Nazis. Mark Frechet was one of many, many American Christians who opposed the war in Vietnam. And I would like these people to be remembered in future generations. And that's pretty much the, the uh, purpose of my life. I would also like to ask Roman Catholic theologians uh, who have a great deal of respect for Tillich, they study him, and they talk about him, and they remain Catholics nevertheless. I would like to ask Roman Catholic theologians, what sexual orientation do they think the Perusia should have? This is a very important theological question that has never been brought up before. And I would also like to ask Roman Catholic theologians, how far are they willing to discuss the relationship between psychosis and religious revelation. Do they think it's blasphemous to suggest that Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jesus were schizophrenics? Is that blasphemous? Or is it something that they should have an open mind about? I can give you an example, a, a, a parallel, between Isaiah and myself. Isaiah ran around Jerusalem naked, shouting messages from God, and people said, Behold! He is a prophet. I ran around the McLean Asylum for the Insane naked, shouting messages from God, and people said, behold, he is a schizophrenic. So what I'm saying is if we can take the same psychological and spiritual phenomena and we, we can choose to give them either a psychiatric vocabulary or a theological vocabulary. My own experience was that it was the experience of psychiatry that drove me insane, and that it was my religion, religious faith, that saved me from insanity. So I would like to suggest that there's a relationship between psychosis and religious revelation that should be respected. It should be respected. Should, people should not be afraid of this subject. They should be have an open mind and an open heart and they should think that maybe it's possible, and they should be able to talk about it without being blasphemous. So far, I'm sad to say, no Tillich scholar has dared write a review of my book. More than twice I've been told I'm not well, welcome to speak at uh, conferences of uh, Tillich scholars. 
And I am hoping that eventually, someday, these people will have the courage to take one little step outside of the comfort zones of their academic ivory towers and be willing to have an open-minded exchange of ideas with me about Tillich, about his schizophrenia, about his Marxism, about his parousia, and one thing and another. So thank you very much for listening to me, and I do recommend that you read my book, What Rough Beast by Robert Dole, published by Austin Macaulay in London in 2017. And thank you very much, Jerry Sweeney, for exchanging these moments with me. Jerry has known me for 48 years. We met in France 48 years ago, and he's put up with me and all these stories for 48 years. And thank you very much to our cameraman, Mr. Rich Stimson.